Chapter two deals with some of the underlying structure of the internet and goes into some details to how it all works together. And so I'll touch briefly on it. We actually go into this in a lot more detail in BA 131, Introduction to Business Technology. The interesting thing on this is where the internet started. It really was formed as an idea of how can businesses that work with the military, how could they continue to communicate and conduct business if the country was under attack? And so they wanted a way of ensuring that communication could happen. And so in the early 60s, they came up with an idea and no, the standard joke, you know, you hear is Al Gore made a famous statement <clears throat> back in his earlier in his political career where he took credit for some of the implementation of the Internet. And no, Al Gore did not invent the Internet. And I'm sure he regrets that comment he made. Uh, I'm sure people constantly remind him of that. It actually started as a defense uh, project, but what uh, isn't covered in the author in the book here in this chapter, and uh, we do cover in BA 131, is actually there was work done in France and England at the same time, and really the internet that we have today is a combination of what was done in the US, England, and France. So the US did not invent the internet. In fact, uh, in some respects, when I look at the functions that are built into the Internet, it's really the French Cyclotis system that allowed all of it to happen. And so I actually think the French should get the lion's share of the credit uh, with the U.S. second and England probably third. Uh, the ARPA, uh, again, that was a military that uh, took it on in 1969. Uh, then the author says email in 1972 became widely used quickly. I would challenge him there. I was involved in business and boy, um, in 1985, still most businesses did not have email. I remember when the company I worked for, uh, one of our major vent uh, companies that we dealt with, General Electric, required us to start communicating with them using email. And so in 19, you know, the mid 1980s, we had to learn what the heck is email. Uh, let's see, let's continue on the history. This is information, interesting information. I'll post a video that I use to, in BA 131, I'll put it out on one of the weekly uh, notifications. It's an interesting video to watch and see the different developments that happened that brought about the internet. Uh, I like here the comment, security problems recognized, not hardly. <laughs> they uh, had no idea back then of the cyber crime and stuff we were going to have to deal with in this century. But here is something I agree with the author on. 1980 was when IBM released this concept, this very first personal computer. It was an amazing breakthrough concept that you could, in, um, you know, even though Apple had developed the Apple II computer prior to that, it was a hobbyist computer. And for those of you that uh, may remember Radio Shack, believe it or not, that company that now is basically out of business, they had their own version of a personal computer back in that time frame, uh, the TRS-80. But those were all oriented around hobbyists, you know, people that like to tinker and play around with things. But IBM recognized that there was a business use and that they could come up with and have 
moved the computing power from a centralized computer at the company to on the individual's desk. And so that really is when things started to change and go because now it was cost effective and affordable for businesses to empower employees with this at their fingertips. And then we see further growth continued. The key point here is that in 1995, the government in the US got out of the business of the internet. It was turned over to the phone companies because the phone companies had these networks of copper wire connections all around the country. And so they took over how to transmit data over the existing infrastructure. And as we see the chart there, what's in the book, you know, it stops at the last number 2015. So I took a look and I found a chart that goes out to 2018. And you can see the number of internet hosts has kind of plateaued up at that somewhere, you know, 1.1, 1.2 um, billion hosts. And a host is, you know, what you're interacting with. It's not the number of websites. So you see there are far more websites than that, but these are the ISP providers, the people that are hosting the information onto the internet. Now, something that's really come up here in the last couple, three years, Internet of Things, or you'll see it abbreviated as IoT. And this is really the concept that you have devices that are connected to other devices. They're not something that a person is using. So before we had someone sitting at a computer or a laptop or with their phone talking to the internet, that was a person using a device to communicate on the internet. We now have standalone devices that are talking over the internet. You have the refrigerator. Samsung makes one that uh, will send you a text message and say, oh, and by the way, on your way home, pick up some milk because it senses that the milk jar is, uh, milk jug is near empty. Uh, we have thermostats and other devices communicating using internet protocol. You know, classic example is Alexa and other things. They are talking to other devices independent of human interaction. It's exploding at a phenomenal rate. And as I cover in uh, BA-131, there's a whole host of issues associated with that that we are not dealing with proactively and uh, could potentially have some just really bad consequences here coming up. Um, yeah, some business transactions can be conducted without human intervention. Uh, that's like Alexa placing an order for items that uh, you didn't know Alexa was going to do that. Anyhow, uh, estimated at the time of publication, there were 10 billion devices and getting up to over 40 billion by 2020. And we'll see in a minute why that has created its own problems. One concept though, that need to talk about just briefly that we do cover in more detail in BA-131. You'll hear me pushing BA-131 a lot. If you haven't already taken it, I encourage you to take it because it does afford us the opportunity to go into more uh, in-depth on these topics. But packet switch networks is a concept where we don't send information. We don't send a file. We don't send an email message all in one piece. Instead, we chop it up into little tiny pieces and send them out individually. They all have, they all contain the appropriate address information as to where they're supposed to go and what order they're in, that they are packet number 123. And then on the other end, it assembles everything. When it gets, it puts up, you know, gets up to packet 122, then it's looking for 123, pastes it all together. What you receive at the other end is one document. It looks seamless, but it was actually transmitted over the network 
in a whole bunch of pieces. And there's reasons why that was adopted. It really becomes fault tolerant. Uh, in the early days of the internet, I can remember painfully downloading a file and getting it to 95% complete, and then the phone line would break. And I go, oh no, you know, I'd have to start all over again and re-download it. One of the things that's, that using packets allows is if one piece is missing, it doesn't ask for the entire file to be resent, it only asks for the piece that is missing or damaged. Uh, let's see, uh, the key there too is the concept that the packets can go different routes. There may be a thousand different ways to get from point A to point B, and a device we'll talk about in a minute called a router decides which route to send the packet on. And it's doing that by constantly monitoring the network traffic, how busy it is. So if one path is congested, it takes an alternate route. And so it's possible for all the packets in a communication to go different ways to get to the other end. And it really doesn't matter that uh, what path they take, they can arrive out of order and the destination computer will collect all the packets and it reassembles it in the correct order. So um, it's really has improved the overall accuracy and speed of the internet. And so, that's what routers, when you hear the term, it's about. The routers are determining how to get from point A to point B. And then the author includes this really simplified diagram showing different devices and, you know, it's the cloud in the middle called the internet. The key that I want you to take away from this image is that all the different lands like look at at the bottom there university h and they've got a bunch of lands at the university the university is not directly on the internet their lands are connected to a router that goes to a backbone router that is on the internet there's actually only a few computers that quote unquote are on the internet all the others are computers that talk to the computers that are on the internet. So you have this main backbone of the internet and then a whole bunch of routers. But you notice that even with the main backbone routers on the internet, if one of those went down, what the routers would do is just switch to using a different one. It's very fault tolerant. And when you watch the video uh, link I send you on the development of the internet, you'll see how that all works. Concept that you'll hear talked about a lot is a virtual private network, VPN. There are times you do not want someone snooping on your communication that's going on. You can use uh, a variety of different encryptions to protect sensitive information. A VPN is one. You'll hear the term tunneling, and it creates a virtual connection between two points that is encrypted. And so even if someone taps into it, it'll just be garbage. And the reason it's called virtual is because the next time you make the connection, it may be through a totally different route to get from point A to point B, just like the packets. But it uh, it appears to you, the user, as permanent, but in fact, it is each time you connect using the VPN, you're getting a different uh, routing of that item, so a different connection. Two other terms you'll hear talked about, and a lot of time you hear it combined as just one term, TCP slash IP. And that refers to two aspects of how do we communicate on the internet. The first, the transmission control protocol, is okay, we've got these this file chopped up into all these pieces. First off, how do we chop them up correctly? And how do we label them correctly so we can send them? And then secondly, when we receive them, how do we reassemble them back into the originals. So that's all specified in the TCP protocol. Everyone around the world uses 
the same TCP. That's the only way that the internet works. We have to speak one language, and that's the transmission control protocol. Now, the IP internet protocol deals just specifically with the address. How do you address the packets and how do you address the, you know, the destination they're going to? We'll see in a minute uh, on the next slide what IP addressing is about. So what you'll hear term is the IP version 4 or IPv4. And it basically said, we're going to define the destination of a digital device that we're sending information to or consequently sending from as a 32-bit binary number. And so when you look at all the possible combinations of that, you get about 4 billion different addresses. Now, if you think back a few slides ago, how many billion IoT Internet of Thing devices were they projected by 2020? A lot more than 4 billion. And so, as we'll see, they come out with a new protocol to address that because we were running out of addresses. Each device has to have its own unique address. Each thermostat, each cell phone, each computer, each Bluetooth device, everything has to have a unique device in order to be able to get information to it in the right, you know, to get the right information to the right device. The IP address itself, we don't display it as 32 binary bits. Binary is just a zero or one. We don't display it. That's kind of hard, cumbersome to remember. So instead we convert it to numbers separated by dots in between. So here's an example of pcc.edu. The actual IP address that is being used when you type that in to your browser is 209.152.46.213. The, the pcc.edu is called the URL, the Uniform Resource Locator, because who wants to try and remember 209.152.46.213? It's much easier to remember pcc.edu. As I mentioned, the increasing requirement for new IP addresses forced them to come up with a new protocol, IPv6. And no, I don't know what happened to, to version 5. Somehow we went from version 4 to version 6. <clears throat> but version 6 uses 128 bits instead of 32 bits. And you think, well, that's only four times as many. No. When you look at the total possible number of combinations, it ends up being a number that is 34 followed by 37 zeros. Imagine that. 37 zeros. A billion has, what, 12 zeros? So that's a billion, 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 roughly. Uh, available addresses, that is a lot. Consequently, that is such a big number that we're no longer going to use the decimal, you know, 206 dot, you know, using numbers because that's only 10 numbers per character. And instead, we're going to use hexadecimal, which provides 16 characters for each or 16 values for each character location to keep the size of the, um, the address under control. Email, you're all very familiar with it, and there's protocols behind there as to how it works with the client server and all that. The key thing I want you to take away from on this, though, is the concept that we need to standardize our communications 
with email. When you're using email as a business in e-commerce, you should have some protocols established. You should have a style guide created for all your employees to use. When you communicate via email, this is how you create a subject line. This is how you respond. This is, you know, the formatting, the font size, the tone. All that should be consistent with your organization. You should document it so that your communications are professional. We cover a lot more uh, detail on that in the communications class, BA205. So at some point, you should take that. It gives you some powerful tools for being more effective in your communications. So when we look at how has the web grown, uh, the author has a chart that goes out to 2015. I did a little bit of research and found out that as of December 29th, 2018, the number of websites is now approaching 2 billion websites. And so you can see from where it was in 2015 at about 850 million, we've had some significant growth and it continues to grow. There's actually an interesting website you can go to that constantly monitors the web and it gives you a real time update as to how many websites there are. And you watch it and every minute there's five, 10 new websites popping up. That explains why when you do a Google search on an item, you may get millions of hits on a particular search term and why it has become increasingly challenging to find the information you want on the internet. It's the old proverbial needle in a haystack. The haystack keeps getting bigger and bigger and trying to find that ideal piece of information we want is becoming more challenging. There's a whole uh, you know, I could spend an entire class just talking on techniques that you can use to narrow the search down and more efficiently find what you're looking for. Okay, so I already mentioned the domain names or URL was developed because remembering that decimal numbers with periods is hard to remember. The key down here is that it's ICANN. Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers that maintains that dictionary that says when someone types in pcc.edu, it goes to their lookup table and says, what is that? And then it comes back and says, oh, here's the number. And that obviously has to be consistent. There has to be only one place controlling it. Otherwise, you'd be getting stuff scrambled and mixed up all the time. So ICANN maintains that master list. It is duplicated on several servers around the world, several different locations. And what's important there is that when you make a change in your who is hosting your website, even though you keep the same URL, the same domain name, when you change the company that is hosting your website, that underlying IP address will change. And so they make a change in the dictionary, the lookup for the URLs, and it doesn't happen immediately because it has to propagate across all the copies that are, you know, instead of having just one master server that would be swamped with requests all the time, it's kind of distributed. And so it can take a day or two for that to propagate to all the different places, the different dictionaries that are on the, the web. So when you make a change in hosting companies, make sure you do it at a time where it wouldn't cause you problems if someone still went to the old website instead of the new website. So pick a, a slack time, uh, you know, when you have minimal traffic because it does take time for that to propagate. So when we're looking at domain names, there's some common uh, attributes that we use at the end of it to indicate what type of a website is it. The most common, of course, is .com. That's commercial companies in the US. Another common one is .biz for business. And 
point out to you if you see .us, that means general use in the United States. Now, the reason that's important to understand is if you look down at the bottom, you see .au, .ca, .de. Those indicate those are websites located in other countries. And it's it can be very useful when you look at a website to know that that website is hosted in a country that maybe doesn't have as good security practices in place. If you see a website that you're thinking about going to and it has .es at the end, you might want to think twice. That's Estonia, and Estonia is noted where to be where a lot of the cyber criminals are located, and they're using services there because Estonia has terrible protections. There's a lot of corruption, people bribing officials and stuff. Uh, of course, there's ways to fool the system and trick it, but the when you see that at the end, you know, like .ca for Canada, it's telling you that that is hosted in a different country. Okay, at this time, uh, take a pause for a minute, and the password for this week's quiz, uh, for Chapter 2 quiz, is HTML, all caps. Remember, passwords are always case sensitive. So make sure you write it down because you will have to use that in order to access the Chapter 2 quiz. And once you have done both Chapter 1 and Chapter 2 quizzes, then you'll be able to access the rest of the assignments for this week. So again, if you don't have paper and pencil handy, press pause because I'm about to go on to the next slide. Okay, so what is HTML? It's hypertext markup language. Well, does, isn't that obvious what it is then? No. <laughs> it comes from the fact that in the early days of creating websites, the designers wanted to have something other than just, you know, text on the screen, just characters. They said, gee, it'd be really nice to have some formatting. Uh, and so they developed this concept that in addition to sending the characters, that we could send some indicators that tell the receiving end, the browser, how to display those characters. So the web browser, when it sees a greater than, less than bracket, you know, it will go, oh, I don't think this is text I'm supposed to display. I think what follows now is information to tell me how to display the text that follows. And then there's a closing one that tells it to end it. And so if you're not familiar with HTML, there are plenty of classes out there. Uh, you can go to YouTube. Uh, we have programming classes at PCC. But it's what it allows us to tell the browser how to display the, the numbers and letters that we're about to send. For example, the author gives in the textbook gives a sample here, it shows this is the HTML page. You'll see there's a, you know, greater than, or excuse me, yeah, um, a, a less than, and then P, and then greater than, you know, there's the characters and body and head. Those are all telling us certain things to do. The LI is a bulleted list, and so you look at that and say, okay, but what does it look like? Well when it's displayed in a browser, this is what it looks like. And so we took that basic text, like in the beginning, we had a tag that said, display this information using the heading one formatting and use this with the heading two formatting and heading three. And there's uh, tags that you can tell it what all the H1 text should look like, how to format it. And so again, this is not a class in website programming, just to point out to you that that's what HTML is, and it gives you the ability to format your 
display on the screen. And we'll talk a little bit more, well, a little bit later, we'll talk about another way of doing that as well. One key thing that you do need to do though with your website when you're creating a new website is to think about how people will navigate your website. Really, really, really important to be effective in your e-commerce website, whether you're selling to customers or to businesses, is to think about how people will use it. When they come to it, what are they looking for? What questions are they asking so that you can get them to the appropriate information in the least amount of mouse clicks? You want to get there as directly as possible. So you should start out and create a diagram that says, okay, the home page, and this is I'm going to display, you know, here are the options from the home page, my top nav bar, how am I, you know, going to navigate and get down there? Again, be thinking about you want to keep it to the least number of clicks as possible. <clears throat> as I mentioned a little bit before with the HTML, you can tell the browser how to format text, but HTML had some limitations. It was cumbersome, and so the concept of a cascading style sheet was developed. And most of the time, this is a separate file that contains a bunch of formatting commands that then are referenced in your HTML code. It's telling it to go to the style sheet and find out what to do with this particular group of uh, text that you want to display. You can include uh, some you know, CSS formatting commands and so forth right in your HTML page if you want to, but like I say, most of the time it's a separate document that you maintain separately. The beauty of there is that you can make a global change to your style. Let's say you want, you said, you know, our, our H1 heading, I want to put it in a slightly different color. By using a CSS that all your various web pages are referencing, you make the change in one place and it affects all the documents. Okay, just uh, touch briefly on the, the way that people connect to the internet. <clears throat> DSL is basically a hyped up, super as fast as you can go telephone line. It is not, you know, I, would, I wouldn't really call it broadband. It's for those people that don't have access to good internet service, they might be able to get DSL through the phone company. It is limited in its speed. It was a big improvement in the early days with the voice modem on standard telephone lines when DSL came out, it was great. But in today's world, it really is slow. If your target market is using DSL, you really have to think about how you structure your website to make sure it works correctly. A lot of people have cable modems and they're providing, you know, they're getting their internet service and their television service and in like my case and my telephone service by using a cable modem that's going to a cable company. You can get pretty high bandwidth using cable depending on what areas you are in the city or the country. Some cable companies have higher band rates than others and like I said uh, you, in an outlying area you may not have as much. You can run into some trouble in that cable companies, you're typically, you're sharing the entire bandwidth available with everyone in your neighborhood. And so if everybody gets on the internet all at the same time in your neighborhood, you can notice things slow down a little bit. A new uh, emerging technology that's that uh, is being implemented in certain areas is bringing fiber optics all the way to your house. 
And with that, the bandwidth is so large that you don't see the, the neighborhood congestion phenomena as much. Certainly what's, what's very common now because of tablets, laptops, and smartphones is using wireless internet instead of plugging in a physical device to the, the internet. And the technology that's used there, 802.11, that just refers to a specification that was developed to say, okay, how does a wireless device communicate to another wireless device? So just like with the uh, TCP protocol where they defined how to uh, encode this information to be sent, that's what 802.11 specifies. Okay, how are we going to transmit this data over the specific frequency of radio transmission? Now, of course, the issue with Wi-Fi is that the signals get, you know, anything that's in the way, if it's not a line of sight, anything that's between you and the, re the receiver that you're trying to get to, that affects the signals. It can reduce it, it can totally block it. And so that's, you know, there are limitations as to how far you can go. Now, the one thing I will mention, and uh, uh, I need to correct the, uh, <laughs> I just noticed that, that the uh, publishers um, slide here has a typo. It's not hot sports, it's hot spots. So uh, I'll correct that. <clears throat> But hot spots can be very dangerous. We cover that again in BA 131. Uh, what you need to do to keep your information safe when you're using a wireless internet connection. Be very careful. Open uh, hot spots are, um, that gives access to criminal, cyber criminals and others potentially to tap into your information so be wary of using those Bluetooth is a very low bandwidth and as the bandwidth goes down the amount of information you can transmit decreases and it's also very short distances typically only 30 to 35 feet and it was designed as a way to connect printers and mice and other things to computers, laptops that are right close by without having to run a wire to make it very easy to connect the devices. And those devices typically didn't need to send a lot of data all at once. Most common use that we see today, of course, is the uh, wireless headset used, you know, for hands-free. That's a Bluetooth device. Another one you may hear of is Zigbee. It's used primarily in commercial uh, device applications such as energy uh, control tools so that you can, for example, you can buy a device that, you know, you, you wire into your house, this is wiring, and you can control what time the lights come on or off. Now we're seeing a lot of those devices, they were originally using the Zigbee protocol. They're now switching to using just standard Wi-Fi technology. Satellite microwave is another option. It unfortunately doesn't have very good bandwidth and it can be very expensive. But for a lot of people in rural areas, it's the only option they have in order to get reasonable speed internet other than using a dial-up modem which just doesn't work in today's society with websites so it's still available uh you know satellites an option like i said for many people in rural areas the only option they have and the good news is it's gotten a lot less expensive the other nice thing is that the satellite dishes used to be huge, you know, seven, eight feet across. 
uh, now they're quite small and they've gotten small enough that they're being used for you know things like television the dish network that's basically a satellite microwave and now that they've relaxed the issues uh, the restrictions on airlines if you have an airline that offer that allows you to connect to the internet that's how they're doing it they have a satellite receiver on the airplane that is talking to this the satellites in orbit to give you the access to the internet the interesting thing about mobile telephones is that in 2014 they say the number of mobile phones exceeded the total population uh, which is interesting number because it says some people have more than one you know mobile phone uh, I'm not sure why you know well I guess you have a personal mobile phone and you have a work mobile phone but anyhow uh, you'll hear talked about 3g and 4g <clears throat> the G stands for generation and it really doesn't specify anything other than the next revision so as they went from 2G to 3G, things got faster to 4G got faster, but it's there's no significance in the number other than it just means, well, we've come out with a new version. And LTE really, you know, has helped the speeds with 4G, but we're, we're still just not quite there. But the good news is 5G is coming. And why that's really good news is that the 5G speeds are enormous. It's really going to be um, not evolutionary, but revolutionary speed to where you can do real-time video streaming, all everything using 5G. It will make the need for having a wired connection to get the speed and the bandwidth you need, that goes away. 5G is going to revolutionize things. It's required because of the Internet of Things. The amount of data that is being sent wirelessly has increased so much that we have to find a way of moving the information faster. And in fact, in order for driverless cars to actually become a reality, they need 5G technology because the cars will talk to each other. So the Internet of Things, as your driverless car is going down to the freeway, it's talking to all the other driverless cars in the lanes around it, and they're all communicating what's going on. And so if one decides to start braking for some reason, everybody knows they're braking and makes adjustments accordingly. Um, that amount of information flying back and forth requires 5G. I'm excited about it because I live in a dead zone and 5G is going to be operating at a different frequency that doesn't have as long a range and so what that means is the current uh, network of cell towers for 4G is woefully inadequate for 5G and so they're going to have to install a lot of new uh, cell towers with the 5G on it. And so I'm really optimistic that when they do that, they're gonna fix the dead zone in my neighborhood and we'll finally have uh, reliable cell phone coverage. Anyhow, that's it for technology. Again, this real high level, we do go into more detail in BA 131.